in church. Come on, get wound up. Let's go. It's such a wonderful day today. Thank y'all for coming. We're glad you're here. Next Sunday, oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be our fall festival. We've got a big meal cooked. we got bounce houses. we got games. Invite somebody. Come and hang out. As soon as church is over, we're going to hit it. Amen? Oh, man, I'm, I'm excited today. I really am. Are y'all ready to worship Jesus? I mean, really be, I mean, are we really ready to worship Jesus? I know I am. If y'all please stand right quick. Hey, I want to uh, tell everybody to be sure and welcome Jeff and Jeannie back. Yay. They've been out on a road trip. God brought them back safely, and they're really good people. If you hadn't got a chance to meet them, they're right here in yellow and blue right there on the corner. But they're good people, okay? Let's pray. Father, let's, I just thank you, Lord. You're such a good God. You bless us with friends, Lord, and you bless us with acquaintances, Lord, that we speak into their lives. Father, I pray that you would use every one of us right now, Lord, to lift up Jesus to the lost and the dying world out there, Lord. I pray that you would use us to bring glory to your kingdom. And I pray that you would just bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Morning, church. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. That's empty place, the treasures of faith are never enough. You came along, put me back together again. Is now satisfied here in your love. Yeah. Well, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. I was a God of the mountain, is a God of the valley. Your mercy and grace won't find me again. Sing it out, church. Boy, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Sing it again. Boy, there's nothing. You turn morning into dancing. You give beautiful ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn days into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who cares. Nothing. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. 
Nothing is better than you, Lord. Maybe we just grasp that, get a realization of that. And so many things are distracting and trying to consume our energies and our focus. And nothing is better than you, Lord.
I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me for all my days. I've been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up till I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God for all my life. For all my life you have been faithful. For all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing. Of the goodness of God. Yes, Lord. And I love your voice. You have led me through the fire, the darkest nights. You were close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. Amen. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. I will sing of the goodness of God. It's your goodness is running after, is running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing. Of the goodness of God. Just sing that again, church. All my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing the goodness of God. I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness.
How great is our God? How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? church how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God amen thank you Lord you may be seated Well, good morning. How are y'all today? You're fixing to get better. You're fixing to get better. Will you turn, please, to the incredible verses of our scriptures, of our beloved scriptures, to Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. We'll start there this morning and then work our way through very shortly to some great truths that have changed my life and that uh, I find out that I, I was thinking this morning, getting ready, I was in my office early this morning, and I was thinking, when I was a young preacher beginning in 1972, I remember thinking as a teenager, street preacher basically, 
there's no, I, I don't have enough I don't have enough sermons. I have three or four that I can find, and I and I panicked about it. I guess we all do as as young seventeen year old teenager trying to preach the gospel. The fear is that uh, I'm going to run out in three or four weeks. My, I find out that now that I'm an old man, I find the exact opposite. The clock is ticking, and I have to preach all that I can. And there's so many messages left to preach, and I thank the Lord for the honor of pastoring this church. One of Paul's great uh, concerns was the churches that he had established and then left to go on other missionary journeys around the Mediterranean Sea there. He took three missionary journeys all beginning from the, from the second church. There are only two churches at the time that existed. One was the church in Jerusalem, the main church where all the apostles were trying to figure out these doctrines. And the other was the, the crazy people at Antioch who didn't know anything. They just sent out missionaries to change the world. And Paul was a part of that great missionary church, the second, I call it the second Baptist church of the Mediterranean, the church at Antioch. They were very missionary minded and very uh, that they just put their money where their mouth was and sent everybody out to do anything that that showed Jesus to the world but as he left uh, uh, he, he established Paul he established churches in the area modern day Turkey the the nation of Turkey we call it Asia Minor he established many churches uh, in that area and then he started getting word that they had turned to a different doctrine. They had turned to a, a di something that was not what he hoped it would be. And what has to be answered in our own lives is that as a congregation known as the church in Peaster, and by the way, welcome to those who are on our uh, live stream this morning. The, the question has to be answered, who are we? Who, who are we as a congregation? What will we stand for? The world is coming up the highway with new homes and new businesses and new highways themselves are getting ready to do something incredible. Houses are being built on every corner. And because of that, there's also congregations that are being put on every corner. So what we have to do is not become intimidated by that fact, but we have to be secure in who we are. We have to know. Now, the only way that we can answer that question is to know who am I, and I'm, I'm saying me, but I'm asking you to ask yourself, who am I? Who am I? What is my purpose in this life? What is my reason for being here? Why did God place me in this congregation in Parker County called the Church in Peaster? Because many of you are not even from Parker County. So what we have to do is define what is true Christianity. Because there is so much pseudo-Christianity going on that you have to know what you believe in and what is true Christianity in order to know who you are and why you're on this earth. I've entitled today's message, Christianity is the cross. That's what it is. Any other teaching other than that, Jesus on the cross. Ultimately, Jesus is Christianity. So we're going to look very quickly this morning at some things that are not Christianity, that are being proposed as Christianity, and so we'll be able to recognize what, it, what is it. Because the world is, I have talked to several people this week, and they want to know. Jody and I started walking again in the evenings, late in the evening, just when the sun's going down. Well, we go down rails to trails. It's not far from our home. And when I, when I come across people, I, I don't want to scare them, but I want, to, I want to ask them and invite them to church. In that, this last week, I had the opportunity to invite two people to church this Sunday. Don't know if you're here or not. But what they want to know is once you identify yourself as the pastor of the church in Peaster, they want to know instantly, and it's a, it's a good question, then what do you believe? What is your doctrine? And you don't want to spend, you know, a whole bunch of time on it, and you ask, you ask them, why don't you come to church and you'll find out, and if you don't like it, you can leave, and if you like it, you can come back next Sunday for even more teaching, because that's what we do. So the question is out there. Both people that I talked to on the Rails to Trails this week asked me when I identified myself, who are you? What do you believe? What does your church hold dear to itself? Well, let me go first of all very quickly and tell you what we are not, what Christianity is not. Number one, Christianity is not philosophy. It is not philosophy. A lot of the churches that are being established right now are built on philosophy. Now, let me tell you the, the problem with philosophy. 
Philosophy is like building a banana split. The first, then there had to be a first. There had to be a first guy who said, I'm going to split a banana and I'm going to make what I'm going to call a banana split. That has to be. They didn't just show up one day in an ice cream parlor. So somebody had the idea, okay, how I'm, okay, I think, I think I'll start with a, with a cardboard boat. And then I'm going to, a banana split. I'm going to call it a banana split, so I have to split a banana. And he laid it off to the side. And he probably went, this, children, is a banana split. Then the next, and he dies. Then the next guy comes along, and he, he's a soda jerk, and he says, well, there, I remember this friend of mine who said he was going to make a banana split. So he looks through his archives and his letters, and he says, I know what this guy did. He split a banana and hence, in a, and he put it in a cardboard boat. Therefore, hence, it's a banana split. But I can do better than that. I'm going to put some ice cream on that sucker. Three scoops right in the middle between the bananas. So he adds, now this is philosophy 101. Then he dies. Then another guy comes along and says the same thing. And he looks in the archives and in his papers and he says, I can improve on that. What this sucker needs is some... Uh, whipped cream. Now, so far, so good. Then the next guy comes along and he says, what it needs are cherries on top. Then the next guy, the, the, the really bright guy came along and said, I'm going to put nuts on the top of it. Then in philosophy, you are making something that you think a banana split should be. You're not asking anybody. You just went, I think, in my opinion, this is better than what came up down the line that was passed on to me. I'm going to improve on this. That is philosophy. Philosophy is trying to improve upon a statement or a belief that somebody else had a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago with Socrates. We get the word philosophy from, this, the, from the philosopher Philo. Philosophy, philosophy, philo, he started it. What was his search? His search for was to find God. Without Jesus, Jesus wasn't born yet. He just wanted to, to, to prove God's existence, to prove that there was a God. He didn't know. So he started this philosophy on how to try, how to, try to find God. And then the next philosopher came along who was a disciple of Philo's. And he said, I can improve upon that in order to find God. And then that guy dies. And then all of a sudden, 2,000, 3,000 years goes by. And they're still adding to their philosophy. The problem with that in Christianity is is what's happened. Somebody can come along during the building of this, of this banana split and say, what I want are pig guts on top because I like pig guts. Now, to me and you, that sounds gross, but somebody eats pig guts. The next guy comes along and says, I can improve upon that. I want some manure on mine. I just like manure. Cow is my favorite. So he throws little bits of pieces of cow manure on top of it. Now you and I are going, oh, that can't be. No, no, we have no right to say that because he likes it. It's his philosophy. It's his banana split. I'm not going to put it on mine, but he's going to put it on his. Have at it, Jack. I don't want any part of it. And by the time this simple thing called a banana split that started with a boat, a, a, a cardboard little boat, which is now a plastic, why? why? Why do we have plastic now when we go and get ourselves a banana split and it's not cardboard anymore? Because plastic won't melt down and leak all over the place and it's better than cardboard. These, even the packaging is improved, what they think is improved. It's gone even from cardboard now to plastic. Everything about it. So what happens in religion is that we come off of philosophy to try to find God, but we're dealing with things that, 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 that man, sinful man, has tried to develop in order to find God. And it's not right. It, it's repulsive to us as Christians, but to a church that's based on, or a congregation that is based upon philosophy can never find God because there, it's only an improvement, what they think is an improvement, a fallen man. So it cannot improve your life. Christianity is not philosophy. 
So we know that. Jesus was not a philosopher. Jesus is the Son of God. Well, all right. The second thing it is not, it's not psychiatry. It's not psychiatry. Let me give you the, de- I forgot to do this. Let me real quick give you the definition of philosophy. It is this, what we just discussed. A study of physical science and ethics. What is psychology? I'm taking this right out of the dictionary. The science of mind and behavior. A lot of people think that if I'll just go to church, I'll become, it, it, it's the best I can do. I'm going to go to church, and we'll, and we'll cover this in just a moment more fully. If I'll just go to church, I will become a more ethical person. I'll I'll, I'll read my Bible. I want to do good. I want to do right. I want to do those things that I'm supposed to do. So what I'll do is I'll go to church to find my answer. Coming to church will not find you the answer. It'll just put you in a position to hear about Jesus. It should. So it is not psychological. Psychology is based basically on, on, on bettering yourself. In your mind, if I, I, I heard, I, I go in early in the mornings, and you know what, we get up very, very early. And I got up long before the sun was up, and I went in to watch. I came in from my office, and I went in to watch the news to see what the weather was going to do this week. And there was a commercial, and the commercial was a very famous televangelist. You'd all know him. He's very, very popular. I don't like him. I think he's false. I think he's a false prophet. And I think he's sending people to hell in a handbasket. That's what I think. So, but, he's, but there he was on this commercial to watch his show coming on in a couple of hours. And he had his pretty wife standing there beside him, nodding at everything that he said. And he goes off and he said, you have the power within you to change your life. And I thought, no, you do not. You can do it on a temporary basis. But when your eternity is involved, you have no answers, friend. And then, and it was a long commercial. It was probably a minute or two long. And when it was done, he went off and the weather was coming on. And I thought to myself, the one word you did not say during your two minutes of having the world's attention was Jesus is Lord. Amen. You never mentioned his name. You give me a two-minute two commercial and I'll embarrass all of you. But we're going to talk about the cross. We're going to talk about the atonement. We're going to talk about Jesus as the Son of God and Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Amen. You're going to say, I wish he'd get off that. I can't. That's who I am. So it's not philosophical. Christianity is not philosophical. Otherwise, you just have a nasty, a nasty, nasty, nasty banana split. It is not psychological because it's not about bettering yourself. The third thing that it is not is superstitious. Most people, or a lot of, I can't say most, a lot of people think that Christianity is basically a superstitious religion. Now, I was surprised when I looked this one up in my collegiate dictionary on what superstition is defined as. Here is the definition of superstition. Listen, I didn't, I didn't write this. Don't get mad at me. I'm just coming right from what Mr. Webster said it was. A belief or practice derived from stupidity. <laughs> read it yourself. If you don't believe that, go find your Webster's Collegiate Dictionary. I'm going to read that again. A belief or a practice derived from stupidity. I don't even have to preach on that. You know where it's going. So what we have to know is that the church must be able to answer all of man's questions through the cross. I have studied the cross for nearly 50 years. And I can tell you with every cell in my body, every bone in me aching this truth, that the cross, the atonement has no holes in it. I've looked for them. I have challenged this. People say, Brother John, do you do Facebook? And I always say, no, I don't have a computer. I've never been on Facebook. And then I thought to myself, oh, yes, I do. This is my Facebook page. It is God's love letter. The only way you're ever going to know God is through this. This is it. There is no other way because it's not philosophical. This is not philosophy. This is abundant life. This is eternal salvation, what played before us. And... 
And we don't read much of it anymore. That's why the church has become so weakened and so dependent on other people building that banana split boat for us. The church must answer all of man's, what's going to be happening in our congregation, it's just inevitable that people are going to come in and they may not think it consciously, but they'll be thinking it subconsciously. Who are you? Why are you here? Why are y'all gathering together? We must not ever be philosophical about it. We must never be psychological about it. We certainly must never be superstitious about it. We have to be Christ-like about it. We have to know what we're talking about. We have to understand the implications and the internal reasonings of the atonement and of Jesus. And why did he come? Who is he? Because when you answer the question, who is Jesus, you will ultimately come to the answer of who you are, of who, who am I? I'm often asked in different ways. I can't even think of the ways, but I answer this question all the time. Who are you, Brother John? And I, I think I said it this morning. I was visiting with a, a couple. They, they're, they're in our church. They're members of our church. And I just came in about 15 minutes till, and I sat down beside them. And, and she said something, and he said something, and I refer back, I'm preaching on the cross today. And then I said this, because I say it all the time, that's all I know. That's all I know. That's all I want to know. Because that answers every question I will ever have about my, my own eternal salvation and your eternal salvation. And the clock is ticking. And we have to win people to Christ, but we have to know how to do that. I don't mean the ABCs of it. I mean, we have to know the technical side of the cross and what's going on with the cross. We have to know that. And most people don't, especially in today's society. Because you're going to read a bunch of garbage on the Internet. I don't have to worry about it because I don't know how. Somebody asked me yesterday, do you tweet? I went, no, I don't think so. Didn't even know what it was. I don't have a tweeter. And I don't have a tweeter account. I don't know what that is. It makes no sense to me. So let, let, let's just look at a few things from the cross from the scripture's point of view. I want you to turn, please, to Genesis chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. Let me show you. Now, we always worry about, we are, and not worry, we are always concerned with the transfiguration of Jesus. And we know that, and it happened. All of God poured out of all of Jesus. The, Jesus just unzipped his flesh, couldn't help himself. Bang, he was just transfigured. But let's look at some prefigurations of the cross. Now, you will remember, and now some of you have heard this before, but I'm going to say it again, because repetition lets us know it for sure. The cross, the crucifixion, is given to us probably, I believe this, probably more in Genesis than in any other book of the Bible. That's why Satan tries so hard to debunk Genesis and to debunk Revelation. He tries everything within his demonic power to destroy what you think of Genesis, of the God of Genesis, the beginning, and the God of Revelation, the end. Once he destroys your thoughts in the beginning of Genesis, of the first book of the Bible, and the last book of the Bible, Revelation, then the rest become, has to be irrelevant. So, what, and God knows that. So what he did was he gave us some what we call prefigurations of the cross. Now remember, Adam and Eve had sinned. They sinned. They, what is it? It's disbelieving God. I'll say this again right now. There's three things. If you'll get this in your mind and your heart, it'll, it'll, your, your Christianity will explode out of you. You only have really three things to do. Love God, believe Jesus, and obey the Holy Spirit. If you do those three things, you're off and running. I'll say it again. You only have three things to do. Love God with all of your heart. Believe Jesus, everything that he said about himself. And he said about his relationship with the Father. And obey the voice of the Holy Spirit. If you do those three things, God will use you in ways that you never imagined. That's it. But how do we get there? Okay, man had sinned. Adam and Eve. Now remember, there were two trees in the garden. One tree was the tree of life. The other tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, the tree of life is grace. What is knowledge of good and evil? The knowledge of good and evil is the law. Well, I, I know I'm, look, I, when we came here, there was no speed limit on 920. So nobody cared how, of course, you couldn't go fast on it anyway. It was just a gravel road mostly. There weren't any cars. There weren't any red lights. The only school that was here 
was across the street, and it was a rock school. It's still there today. They use it for other purposes. None of these schools were even here. So there wasn't really any speed. If there was a speed limit, it wasn't posted because nobody drove it. Then one day they came along and they threw up a 60 mile an hour speed limit sign. Now I know if I'm doing 61, I'm breaking the law. Before if I did it, I didn't know because there's no sign. Once I had the law in my face, I knew that I was breaking the law if I exceeded that number on that piece of board. I had a knowledge of what was right and what was wrong, of what was legal and what was illegal. And these two trees represent one tree. God said, okay, there's only two trees that I want you to concern yourself with. One is the tree of life. That's grace. The other is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's law. If you eat of grace, you will live forever. If you eat of the law, you shall surely die. They ate of the law. That's why God took the tree of life and it's in heaven today because had they eaten from the law and eaten from the grace, they would be in the law, but they would also have eternal life. That's not acceptable. So God took the tree of life and put it in heaven where it still stands today. They simply ate of the law and the law brings death because inevitably I will speed 61 and not 60. I, will, I can't keep the law. Inevitably, I will break the law. And once I have broken that law, I can't get it back. There's nothing I can do for restitution of breaking that law. And Adam and Eve both chose the law. God killed an animal. We know that because he covered their nakedness with skins of that animal. That's the first blood sacrifice. He's giving a prefiguration of the coming Messiah. But then he does something in Genesis chapter 3, and I want to go there right now very quickly. Look what he does in Genesis chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and for his wife Eve and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like us, one of us, and that's a big you, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not angels. They have no uh, creative abilities. One of us. That's the first indication that we're dealing with something other than just a father. We're dealing with a father and son and the Holy Spirit, God in the triune way. Knowing good and evil. And there it is. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life. That's grace. And eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent, out from, uh, sent Adam and Eve out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he came, was taken. He drove the man out. He drove him out. Now he drives Adam and his wife Eve out who have now tasted of the law and death is inevitable in their lives. Watch what he does now. It's a prefiguration of the crucifixion of the Messiah. So God drove Adam and his wife out and at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Look at this picture. You got Adam and Eve standing here. You got the cross up there between the T's, C-I-P. Sinful man, grace, the tree of life, salvation. And what does he place between those two fallen human representatives of mankind and the cross? He places a flaming sword. I'm going to draw you a flaming sword stuck in the ground. And since I'm no artist, I'm going to draw that flaming sword with my hands. Just watch what I draw. If you were to ask to draw a flaming sword sticking in the ground, this is what you would, this is what you would draw. And now God has placed the cross before fallen man and the tree of life. And you have to come through the cross in order to receive life and abundantly. It's a prefiguration. Turn please to Numbers. Chapter 21, verses 6 through 9. We could go off here for months on prefigurations of Jesus. That the people of Israel had sinned. People of Israel had sinned, and they were dying. And God unleashed fiery serpents into the desert. And, and if you were bit by one, you died. There was no antidote to it. The Lord sent fiery serpents. So they're dying. Even they're God's people, they're dying. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that the many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you intercede with the Lord that he might remove the poison, the venom from our veins. 
and Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. You look unto Jesus who has taken our sin and taken our venom and taken our death upon himself. And if you simply look to him and believe, you shall live forever. These are, these are pictures of the Messiah. Satan's aim is to devalue the cross. You go to a lot of churches today, you're going to hear prophetic words. You're going to hear testimonies that is not Christianity. Christianity is Jesus. 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 When I was a young preacher, I alluded to that a little earlier ago, that I was always afraid that I would run out of stuff. And now I'm afraid that I'll die before I say it all. But... It's interesting to me that I remember one time, and it was very, it, it's, it's going to sound funny to you, but it made a lot, and I had to do it once. I did it once, and a revival broke out. I did this. And I said to myself, and it might have been the Holy Spirit, I don't know, it's been too long ago, but I remember at least thinking to myself, if I ever get lost or confused preaching to people, I will just start saying Jesus' name. If I get lost, I can't, and it happened. And one time I was preaching, don't remember where, it's been many, many years ago, and I just became spiritually dumbfounded while I was preaching. I just got lost. I didn't know what I was talking about. And I thought, uh-oh, it's on. So I just started saying Jesus. And all of a sudden some people started standing up and clapping and hollering it with me. The next thing I knew, about 50 people came forward and gave their hearts to Jesus. And I thought, this is easy. I'm making this way too hard. I even remember the word, I remember the word that threw me for a loop. And I'd read the word a thousand times. And it says, and I, I, I just, it, the word just hit me that I could not, I couldn't say the word. And the word was carousing. I know that word. But I looked at carousing in the New Testament. I was preaching about how you'll sin and you'll be carousing and you'll be doing this and you'll be an idolater. And I came across the word carousing and I thought it was carousel or it made no sense to me. So I just started saying Jesus. Little did I realize that it would start a revival. So if you ever hear me just start saying Jesus, he's lost. Just participate with me and good things will happen. All right? So what the devil does, he's trying to devalue the cross. Okay, I'm about done. Now, here's what most people don't realize about the cross. They, they don't realize, and I call it the front side of the cross. There are bodies piled up on the front side of the cross. And what I mean by that, and I say that reverently, but sadly, because we are being taught that if we simply come to the cross, we will be saved. And once we get saved, we can go and live the life we want to live because we have some fire insurance that keeps us from hell. And hell is, see, most of the modern church doesn't even believe that hell exists. I do. Jesus believed it. He talked about hell more than he did about heaven. But one of the problems is, is we think that if we come to Jesus, we're okay. We, we stand at the front of the cross and we go, okay, I understand that you died for my sins and by faith I need you. And then we go and then we live a life of self-satisfaction or self-promotion or whatever we do. Christianity was never designed for you to die at the front side of the cross. Christianity, see, you don't come to Jesus to find Jesus. You come to Jesus the Son to find God the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes through the Father but through the cross. You got to get on the back side of the cross. That's where the journey begins. To the Father and that finding out how much he loves you and how much he cares for you and how much he, he, he wants to have communion with you. All of the joy that I have, I, I have incredible 
uh, uh, repentance and sorrow and grief at the front side of the cross. Once you go through that door and you're on the back side of the cross now, man, you are off and running with intimacy with God, the Father himself, the creator of the universe, and he wants you. That's Christianity. Don't stop at the front of the cross. You got to get behind it and start walking toward the Father and you will find him every time. But you cannot find the Father without going through the Son. You can't do it philosophically. You can't do it through psychology and you certainly can't do it through superstition. I'm talking about an invisible world that exists right now and someday it's going to become visible and you're going to say, oh, brother, I'm in trouble. Brother, John was right. Jesus our representative, fully man, fully God, himself the high priest, himself the lamb, himself the altar, himself the blood. What a name. What a name. I want you to turn, please, to uh, John chapter 3. We're going to read this very, very quickly. John chapter 3. This is our fourth and final one. It's not philosophical, it's not psychological, it is not superstitional, I think I just made that word up, and it's not this, because I think this is the most important point and we'll end on this. It is not a religious exercise. It is not religious at all. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, beginning with verse 1, chapter 3. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, now remember, Nicodemus was, I, you know, I'm not going to spend any time on this, but he was a religionist. We know that he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the 70 rulers of all of Israel. There, this, we know that. He, but he's curious who is this Jesus? And there's curiosity. I want to know more. He was a religious man, a good man. The, the Pharisees get a lot of bad raps, but they were good moral men. Now, they took it to extremes. Josephus tells us in, the, in, in, his, in his history that was written just right after Jesus that there were only 6,000 Pharisees in all of Israel. But they... they, they they controlled the, the religiosity of all of the nation of Israel, whether they were dispersed or whether they were together there at the temple. This man was a good man, but he, has, he was a religious man. But even religious people want to know, who are you? Who are you, Jesus? Because the world is going to ask us when they come through those doors, who are you? church in Peaster. Jesus answered and said, truly, truly, verse 3, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb, can be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. There's your religion. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. There's your Holy Spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who was born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can these things be? That's a good question. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, we speak of what we know. See, we've got to speak of what we know, not of what somebody else says we know. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak, verse 11, of what we know and testify. We witness of what we have seen. And you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe it if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. He's talking about himself. As, watch this. Here comes that prefiguration of the cross. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be, let me go back one word. It's got ink on it. Be lifted up, yes. So that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish 
but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son, he's talking about himself when he says Son, into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. See, that's the dispensation we're in now. Jesus is a grace and he is full of grace, and he's laying out grace for us to be saved. Once he splits that eastern sky, once he appears with all the hosts of heaven to take this world over, he will no longer be a lamb, he will now be the lion. He will go from being our savior to being our judge. Right now, what an opportunity to come to Jesus, because it will not last forever. We are in the dispensation of grace. Verse 19, this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought or made by God himself. That's what he says to him. What is the opposite of philosophy? Abundant life. What's the opposite of psychology, of the mind? Repentance of the heart. What's the opposite of superstition? A belief in the reality of an invisible kingdom called the kingdom of God. And what is the opposite of a religious exercise? A relationship with the Father through the Son, Jesus, from the cross. I'll, I'll end with this. No matter what else happens, no matter how Satan tricks us, no matter what false doctrines end up being around us, this is what I know. And I'll end with this last statement. I won't even preach on it, just not even, not even expound on it, nothing. I'm just going to say it, because I believe this with all of my heart. The one characteristic of God that Satan cannot counterfeit is the cross. He can counterfeit love, he can counterfeit creation, as he, can, he can counterfeit the scriptures, he can counterfeit a thousand things. He can counterfeit himself even being God. He can counterfeit himself into being a prophet. It's called false prophecy. He can counterfeit himself into being an angel but he cannot counterfeit the cross because it's bathed and it's dripping in love towards mankind and there's nothing in Satan of love at all. He is void of love and mercy. His ultimate goal is to steal from the church, kill the church, and destroy the church. And he's doing it right now with, with social media and with bad doctrines and with everybody being a prophet and everybody having a testimony and everybody selling the book and everybody putting out a CD and everybody, yeah, 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 yeah. And everybody wanting to be somebody. All we have to do is keep our eyes on Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. You may have come to the conclusion over the past several weeks, not just today. Today may have helped you some. But let's talk about your eternal life for a moment. And you may have, again, it might have been today, but sometimes, and I did, I had to sit in church for several weeks and hear the preacher out. I wanted to know more about what he was saying. So you might have found yourself sitting here over the past year even, and you know that you want to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You want to get to the backside of the cross. But you haven't had an opportunity. You, you've already done it. And you know that walking down this aisle and shaking my hand or signing a card will not do that. You've already done it. But you may want to be baptized. And it's real. Someday I'll preach on, we have before many times, but I'll, 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 I'll share with you the, the value of your own baptism. It's so important. It won't save you, but it will protect you. But anyway, if that's you, if you'll just stand up as, as Micah begins to play and just come and sit down, we'll, we'll record it because we're going to come up with a baptismal service before too long and we need your name, phone number. We won't bother you. We won't ask for anything. We'll just be able to use that 
contact to be able to tell you when you can be baptized. We don't do it every Sunday, but we do it when we get six or seven people that want to be baptized. So if that's you, just stand up where you are. Come down to this front, sit down, and we'll handle the details. Because you've probably already come. Maybe everybody in this church is already a believer. I hope so. I hope so. Is there anyone? Is your name? Huh? Well, it's so nice to meet you. I'm Brother John. We're so happy that y'all are here today. And you know what? We can we just let's just sit down here for a minute. Come here. Sit down. You sit here and you come up. Somebody sit on this side of me. This is what I think. I thank God. <laughs> arm, please. Put your arm up. There you go. Put your arm right through there. Right. there we go I think that God is going to build up a brand new generation because believe it or not my dear you won't be little forever and I want you guys to love Jesus with all of your hearts would you do that and learn and keep coming to church and love God with all of your heart he loves you guys so much and someday, when someone asks you, who am I? Who are you? You're going to be able to tell them, I belong to the kingdom of God. I belong to the kingdom of God through Jesus the Messiah. Let me pray for both of you. Father, thank you for the children who have such a heart for you. And may we develop as the church in Peaster tender hearts also. Not even knowing why we come forward just to express our love for you in our own way in accordance with our age. I now ask that you would bless these children with health and joy and a love for your church and a love for your son Jesus the Christ. It is in the name of Jesus the Messiah that I pray for these children and for other children around the world to grow up a revival through their hearts, put fire into their spirits. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Can we clap for y'all? <laughs> you can clap for yourself. Clap. Clap for Jesus. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Don't you love it? I love it. I love everything about it. I love you. <laughs> and I love you. <laughs> I think we'll just sit here for a minute. I like this. When, I'm going to tell you something about a revival. When God starts a revival, it will always start with the children. When you see this happening, it is the opening shots of a revival that's about to hit the place. This is the, that's why it's such a good thing. And Jesus said, in order to come to him, in order for a revival to happen, you have to have the child, that heart of a child, an innocence, and just a desire to know him better. Wow, that's cool. That's not a Frisbee. It's called an offering plate. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let me get up and finish what I'm doing, okay? Okay, thank you. I have no idea what I did with my glasses. I got excited, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, there they are. Thank you, Brother Casey. Your, your eyesight's not as good as mine. How can you see them? May we all stand, please, and read our final blessing today. Our final blessing is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 25. 
I'll read from my scripture, which is the same translation that comes up, and let's all read it together, and then we'll go. We'll go home and be blessed today. Thank you again for coming. Wow, where did everybody come from? Oh, let me look. Yeah, a whole bunch of sinners in the balcony. How come it, have you noticed that, yeah, that's what I thought. You've noticed who's up there, right? Yeah, it ain't good. Okay, here we go. Ready? Here we go. Let's read. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, say it, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Amen. Give Jesus some praise this morning. God bless you all. I'll see you next Sunday morning. God bless you all. Thank you for coming.